uh, we have an exam tonight. So let's talk about exam stuff. Uh, Ryan sent out a some sort of review, as I'm sure the other section did. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything. Let me let me look. Let me look and. Uh, I just want to make sure that there's nothing on here that's going to be really kind of a surprise for you guys. Um, well, do you guys have, before I get started, do you guys have any questions? No one? Can you guys not hear me? What exactly is pseudo first order? Uh, we didn't go over pseudo first order. Um, let me see if it's on the exam so we don't have to worry about it. But pseudo first order is pseudo first order is just when you try and keep things. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll post the lectures right after class today. Um, Pseudo first order is when you try and when you keep one concentration extremely high, um, so that the overall change in it is very small. So it's almost as if it's not changing. Um, but I, I don't think we have anything like that in the exam. Um, it's more of an experimental trick than it is something to worry about. There's no there's no calculations involving the Arrhenius stuff, so you won't have to do anything like uh, calculate the obvious thing, calculate the activation energy or something like that. Um, are there any tricky things with solubility? I mean, the things on solubility to worry about, you know, the, I think the common eye on the thing is, the common ion effect is not tricky, but it does require like a, a, uh, a rice table to solve it. Um, that's a little bit more complicated than, uh, than than uh, some of the other ones that you deal with in solubility. Um, yeah, I don't think there's anything particularly soluble. Uh, there's anything particularly tricky in the solubility. So you would like, yeah, I, I think I think it'll be okay. Hopefully. Um, can we do a common ion effect problem? Uh, sure. So let me pull one up here really quick. Yeah, so I'll do a common ion effect problem with a rice table. Let me pull one up so I don't end up, whenever I make these problems up, I always end up choosing something that makes the algebra a nightmare. So let me look up. Um, Problem that. Just so I know the data set works out nicely. It's so for the common ion effect, all you're doing is you're setting up a rice table. The main thing is just that you have one of the, pro the products present already. So um, you just have to account for that. Um, okay, so here's one where it says, God, this is so long. I just want a problem here. Okay, so here's one. So let's say that we have, uh, yeah, we can go over, let's see. So rate limiting step, second half-life, 
thing, we can do that. And then um, knowing the order from a table. Oh, like the method of initial rates, is that what you're talking about? Um, let's, let's, let's not cap. So the common ion effect is, you know, if it's on the exam, it's going to be like one problem, but um, that's probably true of most, most concepts here. I, I don't know, finding the order of the reaction is for any of the rate stuff is going to be important. So we should probably touch on that if there's any confusion there. Um, but all right, so if we've got a 0 0.1 molar solution of sodium chloride, um, and we're dissolving, let's say, lead chloride in it. So we could say how much um, lead chloride can be dissolved. In the solution. <clears throat> um, and so, so lead chloride, yeah, we should give the KSP of lead chloride too. Let me see. KSP for lead chloride is 1.7 times 10 to the minus fifth. So we have this equilibrium here. Um, this is a solid. These are all aqueous. That's important because the solid doesn't appear in the expression for the equilibrium constant. Um, and so we're just trying to figure out how much lead chloride is going to dissolve, or I don't know, you could, maybe another way to phrase this would say like how much lead two is present in the solution after you bring it to saturation. So the, you know, the experimental setup here is I have a solution of sodium chloride um, that's 0 0.1 molar. And then I'm adding enough lead chloride to where, you know, I'm past the point of saturating it. So there's lead chloride on the bottom. Um, so the maximal amount of lead chloride is going to dissolve in there. Uh, so yeah, so what makes this what makes this calculation different is that we have some chloride already present from the sodium chloride. So we want to figure out how much lead chloride is going to be in there. Um, we have to account for that. Uh, so our starting amount of I don't really care about this. But our starting amount of uh, chloride is 0 0.1. Um, and our starting amount of lead, though, is 0. So that's really the, the only difference here is that I know I'm starting out with uh, 0.1 molar chloride, because that's, that's what this is telling us up here. So the sodium chloride is dissociated in solution. I make this overly complicated, but like, uh, I know for students, a lot of times the counter cation can be like, why don't we worry about the sodium, for example? So when I dissolve this in solution, it breaks up into this. So if I start out with 0.1 molar of this, I'm going to end up with 0.1 of this and 0.1 of this uh, at the end. And we don't care about the sodium because it doesn't appear over here, only the chloride does. Um, so that's the only one we really have to worry about. Um, but then after that, it just ends up being. Uh, like a normal rice table problem. Uh, and so we know the KSP because it's given to us in the problem over here. Uh, and so we'll have one, we'll have a one equation with one unknown, which we can solve. Um, I try to circle my charges just so that it's obvious they're charges. Uh, all right, so that's what that's the expression we end up with, and then we just want to plug in values there. So um, this ends up being x. 
and this ends up being 0 0.1 plus 2x, and then those are squared, um, and then ksp, of course, it's given to us, that's 1.7 times 10 to the minus fifth, uh, and then we just need to solve this thing for x. I think uh, for most of the time for these, um, we can assume, you know, that I, I, I know this is annoying, but we can assume that 2x is going to be relatively small. So if we look at our value for ksp over here, it's 1.7 times 10 to the minus fifth. And so this, the smaller this value is uh, than one, so if it's, it's, it's less than one, then usually that means that uh, the amount of, like the, the way the reaction leans, it's not gonna lean much towards the product. So um, however much dissolves, it's gonna be a tiny amount because this is telling us that this is heavily reactant favored. So most of this is going to be as lead chloride and only a teeny tiny amount of that is going to become lead plus two and uh, Cl minus. Um, and so because of that, uh, we can assume that this value here is small and we can do that simplification, which makes our math easy. Let's see, yeah, otherwise I think you end up with a quadratic or something annoying. Uh, and then it's just a matter of solving for X. Uh, which should be called. Um, so yeah, so that's how much, you know, if it was, for example, asking you how much lead. Was in solution. That's how much lead would be in solution. I was asking you for the chloride. It would be 0 0.1 plus 2 times 1.7 times 10 to the minus 3, which is going to round out to being 0 0.1. That's how we know this assumption is safe. But that's how you solve these. Um, so it's, it's everything. It's exactly like any other rise table. The key thing is just that you have uh, a starting, whatever the, whatever ion is common between the salt that you're starting out with, so our salt solution here, uh, and the salt that you're trying to dissolve in it, you have to make sure you include in the rice table. So um, the other, like for example, if you put like, I'm trying to think of what, like if you had like lead nitrate, which I think is soluble, I'm, I might be wrong about that, but if you had lead nitrate, then you, like if this was a 0.1 molar solution of lead nitrate, um, then the lead would just be included here and we wouldn't include the chloride. Uh, but that's how you solve common ion of problems in general. Um, and it's just an expression. The common ion effect is really just a, it's, it's just this, it's, it's a Le Chatelier's principle type thing. It's because I have some product present already. It just means that this is gonna dissociate less. So if you were to compare this to saying dissolve and lead chloride into pure water, which is, I think we did in a lecture, uh, I know that was a week ago, but um, you would see that uh, the amount of lead dissolved is higher um, than when you have the common ion there. Yeah, that's probably asking how much lead chloride can be dissolved in the solution is kind of a weird way. Um, it's kind of a weird way to say it. I, I think maybe a better, how much lead, let's see, how, how would I say that? How much lead? Point one. I guess, I guess you could, I guess the, it, since it asked this, since, since I wrote it this way, um, since it asked how much lead chloride can be dissolved in solution, that is also going to be equal to uh, X. So, right, because this is one and one to one here. Um, so how much it's going to go into solution, it's gonna be the same, so. Because we know that however many moles of lead are dissolved in solution, uh, it's going to be equal to the amount of lead chloride that goes in. Those are tied together through the stoichiometry.
You saw the case for me. Let's see. I don't want to spend all of our time on solubility. Yeah, so on some level, um, you know, the molar solubility is a more like rational way to describe the solubility of something than the KSP. It's literally how many moles will dissolve in one liter. The KSP is a more powerful way to solve the things because it allows you to do things like what we just did with the common ion effect. Um, but if you're given the molar solubility, um, you just kind of do the same thing that I, I'm talking about here. Uh, let's see, I'll do one of these really quick and then I want to move on to kinetics. Um, but yeah, so for example, if it's asking, if it says, uh, silver bromide, um, let's say you're looking at this reaction. So these are both aqueous. Uh, if we're looking at this reaction and we know that the uh, molar solubility Um, which I guess is really what we calculated right here, uh, is equal to 5.71 times 10 to the minus 7 um, molar. Um, then we just kind of use the same relationships. It, it's The thing you got to pay attention to is this the stoichiometry. So what this tells me is that if I put, uh, you know, a chunk of silver bromide in solution, uh, 5.71 times 10 to the minus seventh moles of it, let's say I put it into a liter, uh, are going to dissolve. Uh, and then we look at how that ties into sulfur and bromide. So there's a relationship stoichiometrically there um, that I know it, it seems to remain elusive for students uh, well until the end of the general chemistry too, which is unfortunate. Um, but the... Uh, the relationship is just that if 5 points, if 5.71 times 10 to the minus 7 of this dissolves, uh, that means that um, 5.71 times 10 to the minus 7 of each of these is also going to form. Uh, so it's sort of like the minus x plus th x thing. So if I'm losing x over here, I know I'm going to be gaining the same amount over here. And since these all have the same stoichiometric coefficients, then it's all the same. Uh, then, you know, it's, you don't have to multiply it times any kind of coefficient. So what's the KSP equal? Well, for this one, it's, so it ends up just equaling whatever the multiple of those two numbers is. So 5.7 times 10 to the minus 7 squared. Um, if you had something like, another example, if you had something like calcium fluoride, so now your stoichiometry is a little bit different. Again, we can write out a KSP expression. The main difference here is just that the, I write it over here. Uh, the main difference here is just that, you know, we have this two coefficient that we have to deal with. So that makes things a little bit more complicated, but not, not too bad. Uh, but now we see that it's not, you know, whatever the, the amount that dissolves here, it's going to be minus some amount. Um, plus that same exact amount because both of these are one. So for every mole of this dissolves, a mole of this um, will go into solution. Uh, or I guess it's like for every mole of this, I guess that's the way to say it. For every mole of this that dissolves, a mole of this goes into solution. Um, whereas for every mole of this that dissolves, two moles of this go into solution, right? So you have two X here. So when we're trying to figure out what the KSP is for this one, um, we just want to make sure that we multiply 
Uh, sorry, I need to give you the molar solubility. So if our molar solubility for this is 2.14 times 10 to the minus 4 molar, um, then our KSP is going to be equal to and then two times for the other one. So I guess in terms of workflow for this, uh, you know, the stoichiometry arguments aren't making sense to you. Um, if you have, if you're given the molar solubility and you're trying to figure out what the KSP is, um, you need to make sure that you multiply the molar solubility by the appropriate by the coefficient basically on this side of the equation uh, in order to back calculate the KSP. Um, but it really, hopefully at this point, you're kind of getting the idea behind why these variables are related just since we've spent so much time on them, uh, on K, on solving for equilibrium constants. Madison is correct. She is perfectly describing why CL is not 2.2. I know it gets confusing with all the stoichiometry and stuff. And honestly, um, it's something you get a better handle on once you work in the lab for a long time, which is you know, pretty much nobody in an introductory course. So. Yeah, we'll, we'll be doing two hours as well. Sorry, I, I thought that we, some uh, Ryan had made an announcement about that, but um, yeah, so our, our exam will be two hours. Um, it's, it's, it's a little bit calculation intensive, this exam, but I don't think it's extreme. Um, two hours should be enough, hopefully. Just make sure, my recommendation would be to have, you know, since there are a lot of equations and stuff on here, it's just like make, um, make crib sheets, like just, you know, don't, don't just depend on, you don't want to be flipping through your notes. Um, it'll still open at six. Uh, don't, don't just say, like depend on your ability to search through Google and like look through a textbook or through notes and stuff. Uh, try to, try to have some organization to your notes that you can move through things fast. Now you have two hours for the exam. So you get an additional, what, 30 minutes for the exam. Uh, I'll have to look at what times we change it for, uh, but yeah, it'll we'll probably adjust that. I don't know. I have to look. I I need to talk to Samoy Lenko before I say anything. But yeah, it'll it'll maybe we'll give you an extra thirty minutes on the time window. That makes that would make sense. It's just over kinetics and solubility. Uh, I know. That I think on the campus syllabus it says something about nuclear chemistry, but um, but yeah, it's just over the stuff we went over in class. It's not. We're not doing anything else additional with that. They're, the only thing with radioactivity is the half-life stuff. Um, you know, so if you work through the homework and uh, watch that lecture, you should be good on that. Okay, let's, let me look at the rest of these other questions uh, before the window kind of got away from me. Qualitative content, there's probably some soft questions from qualitative content, but it's not, it's mostly solving stuff. Second half-life again. Um, God, I went over a second half-life thing with during office hours. Uh, it's, I need a kind of a specific problem to go over that. So, the set, so this, there's this idea of, it depends on which order, which, which reaction you're looking at, like what the order is of the reaction as far as what the half-lives are. I started to derive. I started to try and figure out how to derive a uh, equation for the second order one. I don't know if that's a. The the number of half lives is most useful for. Um, uh, 
I don't know why it's called a crib sheet, but a crib sheet's like a cheat sheet that you're allowed to use <laughs> on the exam. Yeah, so for, for half-lives, it's 0 0.5 to the n times a sub o, but that's only true for uh, first order. Um, for second order, half-lives maybe are, it, it, at least when I look at them, I see them as like a little bit less useful, but. Um, let me see if I can find a question really quick. I think the confusing thing that we came across like in office hours was uh, confusing for students on the first life, second, first half life, second half life uh, was how to, what to plug into the equation uh, for half lives. So for example, um, For example, if you're dealing with a first order reaction, I'll just make something up because I can't really find one online. If you're dealing with a first order reaction uh, and uh, the initial concentration Uh, we'll just call it A. So this is just some generic reaction that's first order. Let's say it's A going to be, uh, the initial concentration is like 0.1 molar. And I'm trying to remember how these phrases, how are, let me look at the homework problem. Like, oh my goodness, you guys, Arrhenius is not on the exam. Sorry, Maria, I didn't mean to sound irritated when you say said LA multiple times. I know it's hard to pay attention, especially online. Uh, but yeah, so the Arrhenia stuff is not on, on, on the exam. It's not, that stuff's not terribly difficult. It's just like plugging in numbers and stuff. What is it? Is it we typically have the rate constant here. Is that right? I think homework seven, we had something. Taylor, do you remember which question it was that we went over? That was like first half life, second half life. There's like a whole bunch of them in one of the modules. I think it was homework seven. LE 3.06. Sorry, say that again. My volume was a. Uh... LE 3.06. It was the last question. Thank you. Sahaj, I can't tell if you're trolling me or not, but no, we don't use that equation. Okay, yeah, so here's one. This is a good one. Let me just use the one from the, um, the thing. I, I had mixed success making up problems. Sometimes the like math ends up being a nightmare. All right. So yeah, okay. So here's one where they give you, uh, this is sort of a weird one, but okay. But it says consider the reaction where we're going from A to B. Uh, and then they give us a table where we have experiment one and two. So we're using the method of initial rates here. 
Um, and then we have A, oh, right, because this is a second order one. Uh, All right, so we're given this, we're told it's second order. Um, and then the question is, what is the second half life? So for a first order reaction, the second half life is the same as the first half life. That doesn't change because it's not dependent on the concentration. But for zeroth order and second order reactions, uh, the half-life is dependent on the concentration. So the first half-life, um, I don't know how to like annotate this to make it obvious it's the first. T one half, uh, I'll just call it. So first half-life, Uh, and the second half-life are going to be different. But we can calculate the first half-life. Please. OK, so they're asking for the second half-life for experiment two. OK, so before I kind of get into this, what they're asking for here is they're saying, um, so the first half-life for this is the amount of time to go from zero point two molar to zero point one molar. So that's our first half life. And then our second half life is the time it takes to go from zero point one molar to zero point zero five molar. The third half life would be the time it takes to go from this to 0 0.025. Uh, so that's what they're asking for. So this is sort of what you're thinking about. So, okay, so what's the first and then what's the second? Um, our half-life equation is one over K times a sub zero. What a sub zero equals is dependent on which half-life you're looking at. So if I'm looking at the first half-life, the first one, that's what a sub o is. For the second half-life, your initial concentration changes. So what, we're, so what this equation tells us is it says, given a certain concentration, how long does it take for me to have that concentration? Um, so when I'm trying to figure out the first half-life, it's saying, okay, uh, I'm at 0.2 molar, so I'm trying to figure out how long it takes 0.2 molar to go to 0.1 molar. So I plug in A sub O is going to be equal to 0.2 molar. In the second half-life, uh, now I'm asking the question, well, how long does it take 0.1 molar to decompose to 0 0.05? And so I plug in uh, 0.1 for A sub O. That's how you calculate the different uh, T1 halves. Uh, I didn't go over how to calculate K here, but K comes out of, uh, let's see, is it given? It's not given, but you can calculate it from one of these experiments. So we know that since it's a method of initial rates, K will come from the rate is equal to K times a squared. Yeah, and so you can take any one of these data and plug it in. So you could take, so you plug in like, for example, 0 0.0025 uh, for the rate and 0 0.1 for a uh, and square it. Uh, and then you can solve for k uh, in that way. But the key thing in ter terms of understanding these first half life, second half lives, I think what was really getting for confusing for people is what, where to plug in this. Because we're defining a sub o, like we're not changing that each time. So it feels like 
you know, maybe you always put in this because this is truly the initial concentration, but that's not really what this equation is, is talking about or what they're talking about when they talk about second half lives. <laughs> Did you say that equation, so T one half equals one over K um, A naught, is that only for, what is this, second order reactions or is that for all? That's just for, so, so each, Order reaction has a different half-life. Okay, that, so that's what you use for that. Yeah, the half-life equations are derived directly from the integrated rate law. Like they're, it's a, so they're, they're related. So each integrated rate law is different, so each half-life is different. Okay, thanks. So if you're looking at, so the, ha, so the, the thing about these is that the half-life changes, for a second order reaction, the half-life changes for each one. Um, Yeah. So yeah, so but for first order reactions, the half-life does not change. It's just always the same because it's not dependent on the concentration. Mm -hmm. um, so th this is only the only time it gets weird. So if we knew this order reaction was first order and asked what the second half-life is, it's the same as the first half-life. It doesn't really matter. But there is no A sub O in the, the T1 half for first order reactions. Mm -hmm. Alyssa, do you have a follow-up question or is it still super confusing? I mean, I think, I think it makes sense. I just have to plug it into the half-life equations that we wrote down, I think. And I think it, the, what was confusing was like from getting to the first to the second, I don't have to like add anything or do anything weird. I just plug in my answer from the first one, right? Or not my answer, my concentration. That's Wait, right. Yeah, I think, I think the, yeah. So you're saying to get from, from here to here or from here to here, you're saying to get from here to here, you just make sure that you plug in this concentration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really the only thing. So like, right, so to go to the third one, if we want the third half-life, you just use this concentration. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Last seven for second half-life. What's that? Why do you roll a seven for second half-life? I'm sorry, one more time. My audio is kind of crappy today. I don't have my earbuds in. You just roll a seven of this one. For second half life, I mean. You give it, I just, oh, it's one. Seven over yeah. KA. Oh, it's one. Oh, I see. Sorry. Oh. Yeah, that's just my scribbly handwriting. Yeah, just one. Uh, let me let me look at the test really fast. I don't want to get too blown off course here. I have my... <clears throat> I think it's forty seconds. I think that's right. It's it's in LE. This is from LE. Um, This is question six from Ellie 3.06. All right, let's see. It's probably have time for maybe one more question. Probably. The reaction mechanisms are definitely on the exam. Uh, I can do a reaction mechanism if we have time. We, we, uh, we just went over that in our last lecture. I guess I didn't post that, but I'll post that if you want to brush up on that. Oh, method of initial rates with three concentrations. I don't think we have time for that. Um, solving for Kx and Y in rate. Oh, 
Oh, where you're looking at method of initial rates. Uh, five and practice quiz two. Sorry, I'm looking through the exam because I only have time to answer one more. I want to make sure we do something that's reasonable. It's hard to say. I, I guess method of initial rates, we can do one of those. Or let me look, let me see what Q5 is on practice quiz two. Yeah, okay. Well, this is Taylor's question as well, so I guess we'll do this one. This one will take a second. Um, this is about as complicated as the method of initial rates problems get. Uh, so, it, so we're at question two. Or practice, yeah, it's question, question two practice quiz. No, question five, sorry. Ah, okay, you guys, the hours will pass after three half-lives. Damn these half-life questions. Um, yeah, let's let's do, let's do, I'll do the, let me do the question two from that one. I don't want to do another multiple half-lives when this is this. We've already done one of those. Um, all right, so, goodness. Let's look at Q2, quiz two. So an important thing to differentiate for between on the exam uh, for kinetics is making sure that you're using the right problem solving strategy uh, and right equations. Um, so method of initial rates, that's when we're looking at, um, you know, things that look like this. You've got rate on one side and you've got K and you've got, you know, A to the X, maybe B to the Y. This is method of initial rates. The integrated rate law is this other thing, right, where we have these different equations and we're talking about whether the, whether plots give us lines and that kind of stuff. And there we're looking at relationships between concentration and time. Um, but so anytime you have a table of data um, with rates and concentrations, that's gonna be using this method of original rate. So, so in this question, we have one, two, three, four. So these are our experiment numbers. Um, and then we have a whole bunch of concentration data here. We're given we're given this equation, and they're oh, okay. They're just asking for the rate constant here, um, but we can talk a little bit in this last five minutes about the different things you can extract from this. The subscript of two on B, maybe intentionally to make it confusing. Oops. Uh, and then they give you initial rate data over here. All right, so 
in this problem, like all they're asking for is the rate constant. So a lot of this is just superfluous. Um, I guess I have a, pr a problem solving video for this. But so if, if you want to know what k is equal to for this, it doesn't matter which. So in order to solve for k, well, OK. Actually, no, this is, gets reasonably a pain in the ass. So in order to solve for k, we have to know what x and y are. Um, and so we have to do this comparison. So this one is a little messier than the one I did in the problem solving video, only in that we have an extra um, concentration bracket here we have to worry about. But we're still just looking for places where two things are constant uh, and, and one thing is not. So like, for example, if we want to figure out, so this one should have, I really am writing out the rate expression here. Let's say I have that. Um, if I want to figure out, for example, I won't be able to work through all of these, but if I want to figure out X, I'm going to have to find a place where, um, where A is changing in concentration, um, but B and C are not. So that's sort of the tricky thing that we have to deal with here. Um, yeah, so if we look, if we come over here and look at, let's stay in green. If we look over here, um, B, we can look at, con we're looking at concentration B. When I'm trying to figure out what data to use, I'm just looking for places where B does not change. So the only experiment where B, the concentration doesn't change at all is between experiment one and experiment three. So I know that for A, I'm probably going to be using that. And if I come over and look at C over here, I'm trying to, again, find places where the concentration isn't changing. Um, and so I could use this one, uh, or so I could go from experiment one to experiment three, or I could go from experiment one to ex experiment two to experiment four. Um, but we want to make sure that we isolate out just A. And so we want to use this one. Um, we wouldn't want to use this one because while this is constant, this is changing. Um, uh, so we can't actually say anything about, you know, what the effect is on the rate, for example, uh, as we go from here to here, uh, because we don't know if the rate is changing because A is changing or because B is changing. So you have to find places where they're both constant. So this, but with them, because we now know, now that we've identified where B and C are constant, we can figure out what X is equal to, um, because we can say, we can say, okay, well, we went from 0 0.1 to 0 0.4. Um, and we can set that equal to the rate for going from experiment one to experiment three, uh, which would be, uh, it's actually, it's better to go the other way. So we want to go 0 0.4 over 0 0.1. So I'm taking experiment three here and I'm putting it over experiment one. times 10 to the minus three. And this allows us to get X. So X is going to be equal to whatever this is. Um, usually these work out pretty cleanly math wise. And you would just go through this process for all three of them. And then you end up solving after you have that, then you can just solve for the rate from any of the data. Um, sorry, I was trying to get caught up on the chat window there. Let me solve this really fast. So if the method of initial rates thing is giving you trouble, go and look at the um, solved problems on YouTube. One of them is a, a method of initial rates problem. So I end up with four to the X equals 16. So, you know, you don't have to use, you could use logarithms to solve this, but I think it's pretty obvious that X must equal two. So X now we know is two. So we know that it's second order and A. Uh, and then we just go through this process again for B and C. Um, once we know X, Y, and Z, then we can just calculate K. And we just use any of the experimental data. So for example, once I know this, like, so assume I know X, Y, and Z, if I want to figure out what K is, I can take 0 0.1 and plug it in there. 
0 0.2 and plug it in there, 0 0.3 and plug it in there. And then I can take the rate and plug it in here. And then my only unknown is K. Um, and that's the workflow for pretty much all of these method of initial rates problems. They're all solved virtually identical. This is about as complicated as they get, uh, at least in this class, um, because you have three different things here. I don't know if we have one where there's three different ones on the, on the exam, but if you can do this, you, you can do them all. Uh, I, I, don't, I ran out of time for doing a reaction mechanism, but we can do one of those in, in office hours. But yeah, I don't, in terms of preparation for the exam, um, look at the reviews that the TAs went over. And then I would just look at, I, you know, it's the day of the exam. So, uh, but yeah, look at all the practice problems that we posted on there. Um, look at the homeworks, look at the LEs. That's what, that's what they're there for. Um, yeah, the DCAM website is pretty good for this one. I think they also have uh, like help sheets on there or whatever, um, which are also useful. So take a look at that. Get your stuff. Get your stuff uh, organized for the, uh, the exam tonight. Um, that's the main thing. So, you know, your ability to kind of work through these problems is, it, I think one thing that's kind of hurting students with the online exams is, you know, for a normal exam, it's like you have to come in with just your brain. So you have memorized stuff and you have everything kind of, um, the practice quiz did not count towards your grade. Uh, but you have to come in with all that stuff in your brain already so you can work through problems a lot faster. Uh, when you're having to look at sheets and look at crib sheets and stuff, your your ability to solve problems is a lot slower. So um, you just need to make sure that if you are going that route where you are just trying to use notes, you don't want to just be kind of randomly searching Google during the exam. You want to have everything in front of you so you can kind of go a little bit faster. You have a little bit extra time. And some of the problems on there, if you know what you're doing, are, are extremely easy um, and should take like one or two seconds to solve. Um, so hopefully the, the extra half hour and that uh, makes it easier for you guys. If you guys ask me about the Arrhenius equation one more time, I'm failing everybody in the class, just straight up. <laughs> Y'all are the worst. Uh, all right, <laughs> give me a, uh... yeah, we can finish this and uh, we can finish this problem in office hours and I'll work through reaction mechanism. <laughs> All right, let me take a break. <clears throat> I'll be right back. Let me see if I can get this video from last week up on YouTube or from Monday on YouTube. Christine. Christine. Hey. Good morning. Sorry. Okay. Oh. 